We come to God's word now. Uh, this is the final thing we'll do in our service today to hear the message. And uh, the reading is from Luke chapter 4. And we're going to think about a very interesting episode in the life of Jesus and see what light it sheds on him and, uh, and therefore also always on us. It's from uh, the fourth chapter of Luke's gospel. It's Luke chapter 4 beginning at verse 14. And it's about the time that Jesus uh, returned to his hometown. The hometown boy comes home. Uh, will he be received by his own people? And what will their reaction to him and his teaching be? And what will our reaction to him and his teaching be? Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14, says this. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips isn't this joseph's son they asked jesus said to them surely you will quote this proverb to me physician heal yourself and you will tell me do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in capernaum truly i tell you he continued No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Heroes. Almost all people across all time have a hope that a single special person might change the world and even save the world from itself. I saw a birthday card a couple of weeks ago. Um, In fact, my boys uh, got this card. It wasn't my birthday, but I think they wanted to save it up for next year. And it said, A long time ago, a very special person was born who was destined to change the world. And then you open up the card. And it said, calm down, it's not you, it's Jesus, but have a happy birthday. The longing for the one to come, that is not just a Jewish thing. Waiting for the Messiah, that is a universal story. A universal myth. Not a myth in the negative sense of something that's just made up, but a myth in the sense of the story that is so woven into us, it reveals something very important about human nature. Now, I don't know how you react to that. You might think the reason we tell stories about the one is because the world needs rescuing. But on the other hand, perhaps you think it just proves how weak and stupid people are, always hoping that somebody will help us, when we really have to help ourselves. This hero worship is, you know, it's like a fault line in human nature. It makes us passive. It makes us able to be manipulated by people who come along and say, I'm the one. But I'm convinced this isn't just a common myth. It's our essential human story. 
You know, Star Wars is about the chosen one who's going to bring balance to the force. Harry Potter is the chosen one. Beowulf, Superman, the lone invincible gunman in every Western movie you've ever seen. This is the story we tell ourselves. Who will come to save us? People feel this way about real people and real leaders. Ezra Klein said this about President Barack Obama. He is not the word made flesh, but the triumph of word over flesh, over colour, over despair. Obama at his best is able to call us to our higher selves. Mark Morfer went all out when he wrote this. Obama isn't really one of us. Many spiritually advanced people identify Obama as a light worker, that rare kind of attuned being who has the ability to lead us not merely to a new foreign policy or health care plan, but who can actually help us usher in a new way of being on the planet. These kind of people actually help us evolve. It's a lot to put on the president's shoulders. And I would think it's patently absurd. But people have said it. But Jesus opens the prophecy that says somebody will come and they will set us free and he says, I am the answer to that hope. Later John the Baptist says, are you the one? And Jesus says, Look at what I do. What do you think? What would it be for someone to be the one to save us? What would they say? What would they look like? What would they do? Would they bend an iron bar? Would they shoot straight at all the other guns in the West? Wouldn't it be the one who could and who could give a reason for taking hatred out of the human heart. If it's ruined relationships and injustice that ruins the world, isn't the question, what am I supposed to do with the hatred of other people toward me? What am I supposed to do with the hatred in my heart? Do I respond to others and their harshness with a harshness of my own? Is there any other way? Can Christ break that cycle or not? Could he be the one? How? Some of us are haunted by our hometowns where we grew up. School reunions can be funny affairs. Lots of people like myself who leave a small country town like I did 30 years ago are a bit like that in relation to their hometown. Uh, Some of us felt like we never quite belonged and we needed a different life. But when you go back there, the emotional, um, the pull of the place is so overwhelming. Uh, You feel like you might have betrayed the place because you wanted to leave it behind and and go on to something bigger and better. Bruce Springsteen grew up in a poor, insulated, deeply Catholic little suburb in New Jersey and he wanted out. But after he became successful and and famous as a rock star, he would often, often drive back to that little suburb secretly and he'd never even get out of the car. He'd just sit there for hours and look at the place flooded with memories, haunted by the disconnect. You know, why didn't I belong here? Why does Jesus return to his hometown? For a hero's welcome? No. He knows something about the people there and he knows the especially ferocious emotions we have about our home, our own people, that these things are going to bring out of them a reaction that's going to set up an explanation of his whole purpose. What our need is as human beings, who he is and what he will do. 
So he goes. And when he goes to his own people, he puts his cards on the table. Isaiah predicted that when the servant of the Lord came, he would have the Spirit of God to bring freedom, sight and release to those who are in chains, to those who are blind and oppressed, and bring God's favour. And Jesus says, today this scripture is fulfilled as you are listening to me. I am the sermon, and I will bring God's rescue to you. Your hero is here. And they like what he says to begin with. Verse 22, all spoke well of him and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. They may be surprised that someone they know could ever become their hope. They are oppressed by many enemies, many sicknesses. They're the victims of many misfortunes. And if Jesus could help them live their life, well and good. I mean, it's only fitting that Jesus would be for us. After all, we're his own people. And we have a rightful claim on God's blessings. As rightful as anybody, probably more. So if this one has come to help us in some way, good. That's what they're thinking. We don't see it at the time, but Jesus does, and I take it, that's why he provokes them. He knows that they don't really accept him for who he truly is and what he's really come to do. In fact, once they understand him, they will hate him. And he must show them that's the case. And he must show us that's the case. Because if you really understood him, you might hate him as well. So he does provoke them. And the party sure goes south very quickly. What you're really thinking, says Jesus, is that I have to do for you what I've done for others or I can't possibly be who I claim to be. It's like the old proverb, I'm not really accepted in my hometown. You can see their faces changing. Whoa, how dare you? My parents visited Liverpool in England a few years ago. Uh, They're big Beatles fans. So they visited all the sacred sites in the Beatles' hometown in Liverpool. Uh, Sometime before they went, not long before, Ringo Starr, the famous drummer from the Beatles back in the 60s, had said that he could never imagine himself living back in Liverpool. Uh, Ringo lived as a multi-multi-millionaire in California and he said, somebody asked him, would you ever go back to Liverpool? And he said, I don't think so. This did not please the people of Liverpool. I can assure you. And when my mum and dad went to Liverpool, they saw graffiti on many buildings. Rack off Ringo, we don't want you here. And when they told the lady at the hotel that they were going on the Beatles tour, her first words were, well, we don't like Ringo here anymore. And the Nazarenes, they turn on Jesus with a fast and furious Hatred. Like a wedding where a drunken punch-up erupts, all of a sudden it's a whole different atmosphere. Why do they turn against him? What has he revealed that was bubbling beneath? What wound has he torn the scab off? Is it just because he tells a strange parable about you know how Elijah helped a Gentile woman And uh, Elisha helped a Gentile man, this story from the Old Testament. Is that it? That the people of Nazareth are, are, are racists? They don't like God helping Gentile people? Is this for real? And even if that was what was happening, fine. You know, I'm not a racist. I could never hate God for suggesting that his mercy goes to different people of different ethnicities. I mean, how relevant is this to me if that was their problem? And it's not mine. 
Let's think. Jesus does not choose these accounts from the Old Testament at random. Naaman was a Syrian general, the man who was healed of leprosy in the Old Testament by the prophet. Naaman was a Syrian general. That means he was a killer of Israelites and an enslaver of Israelite children. The people of Nazareth live under the oppression of the Roman Empire, an empire with such power and violence it makes Naaman look meek and mild. The people Jesus addressed in that synagogue are hurting people and it's generals and warriors who hurt them. They've been hurt and they've been hated. Hurt and hated. (laughs) And Jesus says, I come to offer the blessing of God to those who have cursed you. And if you cannot accept that, then you do not accept me. And then your enemies and the evildoers of the world, they will repent and they will receive everything from God and you will not. What kind of message is that? Now we begin to feel something strange inside. Unbalancing. God's purpose. God's purpose is not just to offer me healing, but to offer it to those who have hated and hurt me. Understand the grace of God, says Jesus. I come to bring the chance to repent and turn and offer of God's freedom and forgiveness and eternal life to fathers who leave their infant daughters in the forest, to Australian jihadists and IS militants, to pedophile priests, to young men who drive as drunken fools and maim people for life, hurters and haters of the world and in your life. They too will hear about the grace of God and I will offer it to them. Now what do you say? If they return to me, I will have them back. Well, I say I feel angry that God could love those I hate and I feel so much hatred that I might think about throwing somebody off a cliff. That's how they felt. Who would teach such a thing? That the grace of God could be so outrageous? Who would be such a person? Only Jesus. This is the gospel. The God who has been hated, saving those who hate him. The mob drives Jesus to the cliff. Oh, they hate him. But he leaves them be. He will not let them have their way just yet, but he will soon. And they will kill him. And he will lay down his life, even for those who drove him to the cliff that day this is the God who loves his enemies no other God or hero in the world has ever been like this now there's two things to notice about the Isaiah prophecy that Jesus read the first is that the word for release and freedom in verse 18 also means pardon and forgiveness And the prisoners in verse 18 are not necessarily innocent, as most prisoners are not innocent. The year of the Lord's favour was the Jubilee year in Israel when what happened? Debts were cancelled. In other words, Jesus is saying, he comes for the guilty. He comes to those who are in debt, to those who have hated God and hated each other. That's who we are, no matter what we think of ourselves. And he comes to do what? 
That's the second thing to notice. Jesus reads the Isaiah prophecy, but he leaves off half a sentence. You don't normally do that, but he does. Because Isaiah had said that he will come and bring the Lord's favour and the day of God's vengeance. Jesus leaves that off because that's not why he came the first time. Now is the time before the judgment. Now is the time for all of us haters to come in from the cold. His door is open to you. But don't think you can have him and not have his ways. Don't think you can have the king who loves his enemies and not have to learn how to love. He said, love as I have loved you. Taylor Swift had a song not too long ago, Shake It Off. Haters going to hate, hate, hate. I'm just going to shake, 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 shake. Shake it off, shake it off. I keep cruising, won't stop grooving. It's like I got this music in my mind saying it's going to be all right. I shake it off, I shake it off. Now that's the best the world can do. And it's not bad advice. Ignore the hate. Move on. Move around it. You know, just keep moving. Just worry about yourself. Shake it off. But that solves nothing. It breaks no evil. It heals nothing. It cannot jam up the spokes and stop the wheels of hatred in the world. But the gospel does. This is something new in the world. Jesus' love for us who hate him turns us into people who can love even those who have hated us. Jesus coming to we who were his enemies turns us into those who can even care for our enemies. Pray for those who have done us harm. Witness to those we might rather see judged and break the cycles of revenge in our lives. In other words, he brings the healing. But it is no easy thing. Forget for a moment the big issues of prejudice in the world. Sometimes for me, I can't even bear the thought of giving up my hateful thoughts of others. I've felt such despising feelings about someone for so long, it's like a a nourishment. Delicious. And I would hate, really, to start praying for that person to pray that God had blessed them. I'd hate to start giving them the benefit of the doubt every time they open their mouth. I'd hate to spend a lot of time with them. Your teeth grind at the thought of it. And this is only people who have been a little bit rude to me in my life. Disappointed me or gossiped about me or told a little lie. Not the most damaging things at all. And still we reach for vengeance and savouring the hateful thoughts. Perhaps at best we reach for just shaking it off and trying to move on. But Jesus says no. More than that. The gospel is a pardon for the guilty. God's hero who was hated by us offering grace to those who were his enemies. Jesus is the one who dies on the cross with pardon on his lips. So he's the only one. He's the only one who always and at all times deserved to be loved and loved those who did not. So he's the only reason and the only power in this world to sweep away the hate that plagues our lives. He's the only one to heal it. Who else would it be? It's only him. Let me pray. Our great God and Father, we thank you for your son Jesus, the hero who gave his life, not only for those who would love him, but for those who drove him to that cliff for those at the foot of his own cross. 
praying, Father, forgive them. And here is the only hope for our world in the revolution of the person and the sacrifice and the command of Jesus, the King who would give all. Teach us to trust in him only and teach us the new way, his way, to know that our healing can only be found there. Bless us in this, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.